everybody. I'm really welcome. I'm <laughs> really happy that you're you're all here, and I'm very excited about our guest speaker that that we have today. I think I'm going to take one minute because I don't want to forget this. I want you all to be aware that you can look at the League of Women Voters of Colorado's website and look at the Education Task Force page. You will get all sorts of information on that page, including um, the link to the State Board of Education meetings that are this week. Um, so it, there are articles there. There's all sorts of um, information that you may find um, helpful and interesting. So let me, give me one second here. It is my great pleasure um, to introduce uh, Commissioner Susanna Cordova. In June of 2023, Susanna Cordova was named the uh, Colorado's 18th Education Commissioner and the first Latina to hold the, the state's top education position. Um, prior to being the commissioner, you can you can hear what an educator she is, because um, Susanna spent more than 30 years in education, serving as an assistant principal, a principal, uh, director, a chief academic officer, uh, chief schools officer, and deputy superintendent before becoming the superintendent for Denver Public Schools. One of her priorities um, as superintendent was to break the historic patterns of inequity um, that have resulted from uh, far too few black, brown, and low-income children succeeding at high levels, and it paid off. Uh, Susanna uh, led significant improvements in student outcomes including an 8% increase in graduation rates for African-American students and 10% for Latino, Latina students. She's very proud of her commitment to biliteracy and bilingualism um, and helped shift the district to an asset-based approach to supporting multilingual students. After leaving DPS, um, Susanna, served as the deputy superintendent for Dallas Independent School District, but we're happy to have her back. <laughs> um, uh, Commissioner Cordova grew up in Denver and spent her entire uh, student career in the district uh, that she later went on to lead. Her educational background includes a master's degree in curriculum and instruction, and an education administration master's from the University of Colorado, Denver. And she anticipates receiving a doctorate in education from Southern Methodist University in 2024. Congratulations on that early. I was um, just coding a transcript right before this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Been there, done that. Um, she lives in Denver with her husband. Um, her son is a high school teacher in Denver. And congratulations to her daughter, who is a re recent graduate of Stanford U University. Um, Commissioner Cordova, we are excited that you are here and uh, can talk to us about uh, your perspectives uh, for the district, your goals for the districts, and your, your priorities. You have an exciting state to work for. <laughs> Welcome. Awesome. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for the invitation uh, to be here with all of you. Um, I'm always um, so inspired to be with people who are choosing to spend their time, their talent, and their treasure on um, civic engagement, uh, because I deeply believe um, it is the only way that we can ensure that um, our communities are thriving is when uh, people take the time to get involved and get engaged um, and um, do things like this. So it's really a, a pleasure to be here. Um, you heard a little bit about me um, from that background and incredibly um, grateful to be back in Colorado and I uh, want to share a little bit uh, about my uh, transition. I'm just starting my third month on the job. 
<laughs> so started in late June. Um, it was my 10th week. Um, and uh, as I've come in, uh, I've done some very intentional um, listening and learning. Um, and it has helped me really think about three priorities. I'm gonna share my screen if that's okay um, with some slides really quickly. Let me see if I have this. And you all, let me see if I got that right. Can you all see that now? Yes. Yeah, great. Um, part of what it really inspired me to come back to Colorado um, is the um, really strong educational focus that our State Board of Education has had what the governor has um, and the work that has already been put in place. Um, and I kind of sum them up in these three words that we need to start strong, stay engaged and leave ready. Um, and when I think about those three things, I think about them both for kids as well as for adults, um, which I think is really important. Um, uh, much of what I wanna talk about today really um, gets into what this means for kids, but I'll touch on some of the parts for adults as well. Um, Colorado, I think, has a really strong approach to thinking about strong foundations. For over 20 years, we've had a focus on uh, building strong foundations in literacy. Um, this year, we have rolled out the Universal Preschool Program in collaboration with the Colorado Department of Early Childhood um, because we know the research is so strong that when we get kids started well, um, it's far more likely that they'll stay on track. In fact, when kids are reading um, on grade level in third grade, uh, they're four times more likely to graduate on time. Um, and Colorado has been a real leader in the space around building these strong foundations, um, including having recently just been named the top uh, state for educator preparation um, in early literacy. Um, we've rolled out um, science and reading training for all of our pre-service teachers and all of our in-service teachers and school leaders who work uh, with grades um, kindergarten through third grade now um, are required to have that training in early literacy um, that they can um, take with them wherever they go. So really, really important to have that strong foundation. Um, and I'd say when you think about that strong foundation, it's really important. As I mentioned, we've just rolled out universal preschool. I'm sure um, you've heard um, about the opportunity for more and more kids um, to join our preschool programs um, across the state, not without challenges in terms of this initial rollout, but the Department of Education has worked very closely with the Department of Early Childhood um, to make sure that all of our students are being served well, and particularly our, our students with um, special needs, which is um, the role that the Department of Education plays with early childhood. We also wanna make sure that we're addressing the needs in rural Colorado um, in uh, those early school programs. Um, and we know that in some places, there may only be a school district that offers early childhood, but there also may only be community providers. Um, and so really making sure that we're supporting rural Colorado um, with their needs around um, access to early childhood. And then also thinking about how we support our families um, with resources, um, how to get access, um, all of the really important developmental skills that are so critical for um, our children really start at home uh, and thinking about those early supports um, that we have. Um, the stay engaged component, um, I really think about from the lens of helping our students who are uh, grappling with um, many of the lingering effects of school disruptions from the pandemic. Uh, there's been, um, I think, alarming research, actually. The um, National Institute for Health um, did a survey of young people and found that for adolescents between 12 and 21, um, the numbers of students who meet the clinical criteria for depression and anxiety um, are between one in four and one in five, um, and even higher for, for young women. Um, and so we know that it's gonna be really important to address um, many of the aspects of the mental health crisis that are happening for our young people, um, for them to be able to be successful in school. In fact, tomorrow um, we have a conference in Colorado Springs that I'll be attending where we're supporting educators with resources around um, youth mental health well-being, um, because we know when we do that well, we see greater attendance on the part of our students, we see greater engagement in learning, and we see 
um, dramatic improvements in behavior. So something that we know is going to be really important for us to keep working on. But staying engaged also applies to our adults. Um, many uh, of our communities are grappling with the teacher shortage, both with teachers um, who have left the profession um, over the last several years, as well as um, lower numbers of people joining the teaching profession. Um, so it's both a recruitment and a retention um, need that we have to keep our educators engaged. Um, this has been a real challenge in Colorado. And in fact, we have 178 school districts. One of the strategies that many places, particularly in rural parts of the state, have deployed is um, using a four-day school week. Um, mm -hmm. And um, we have 124 school districts that use a four-day school week now in part to try to recruit more people, particularly when they can't afford uh, to pay higher salaries. Um, but we also know that we can do a better job of getting more people into the profession. The Department of Education has um, 40 approved pipelines. So you might think of the traditional pipelines like going a university route, um, but we also have alternative licensure programs that districts can run, that support partners can run to try to get more people um, into the teaching profession. One of the um, statistics that has been very impactful for me in my thinking about um, de developing these pipelines is that 60% of teachers teach within 40 miles of where they went to school themselves. Um, and so I think really the key to helping us solve the teacher shortage is growing more teachers right in our own communities. And so that means um, thinking about pathways into teaching in rural places um, as well as in urban places so that you can actually get people who are already with you to become teachers. Um, and we also know that when we have teachers who come from the community, they understand the students' experiences right there in that community, and particularly for communities of color, um, having more teachers who reflect the diversity um, in those communities will make a, a very large difference. Um, and then the last part of my three-prong um, approach um, is this idea of leave ready. So if we start strong, we stay engaged, uh, the final thing that we need to make sure that we're doing with our students is making sure that they leave ready um, and that we're preparing them for the future. In many cases, that may be a pathway into college, uh, but for some students, um, it really is more about building 21st century skills, the skills of collaboration, of listening, of critical thinking, um, and also those opportunities for real world experiences, um, work-based learning, um, much more uh, broad-based thinking about post-secondary learning so that maybe it's a traditional associate's degree, maybe it's a four-year degree, but maybe it's a work-based certificate, maybe it's a certificate in coding, maybe it's uh, becoming a journeyman apprentice um, in uh, as an electrician. Um, maybe it's a medical pathway or a business pathway. pathway. There are lots of different routes um, to prepare kids for the future. Um, and we do that by working in much deeper collaboration with our partners in the business world um, and really thinking about how we can support students um, with those um, opportunities for work-based learning uh, with real world business partners. Uh, just three weeks ago, the Secretary of Education from the Federal Department of Education was here in Colorado and announced a $25 million grant uh, to help bring more business um, businesses and schools together um, with grant funds to build out these pathways uh, to work-based learning. Uh, so something that Colorado is doing really very well. And then finally, when we think about um, leaving ready, it's making sure that we're investing in education for our educators, um, that we're thinking about how do we make sure we address the salary concerns um, that many communities are grappling with in terms of teacher pay, um, and so that we can recruit and retain people um, in their communities. Um, one of the things that I think is to be commended is over the past several years, the Colorado legislature has helped um, invest more funding in education. Um, and it's a place where we're gonna continue to work to make sure that we're bringing um, those really important resources back in um, to the work that we're doing in schools. Um, and then we also do that through lots of different grant funds, um, both around school construction, as well as early literacy grants, um, grants to help bring um, resources and training 
to schools that are struggling um, and in need of rapid improvement um, because we know that it's through these investments that we'll be able to see um, our students really thrive for tomorrow. And so finally, um, just to wrap up these slides before we open it up for some questions, we've definitely made progress. Um, in just about a week ago, we announced the results of our most recent uh, school accountability results. And we see far more schools um, receiving the top two tiers of um, ratings than we had um, since before the pandemic, which is great. Um, but we know that there's still a lot of work to do. We also unfortunately saw some schools slip down um, into that um, accountability clock that's so critical for rapid improvement um, because we know that there's so much uh, for us to do uh, to prepare students when schools are struggling. We have seen um, some really nice gains um, with young men, uh, particularly in math, but unfortunately, we've also seen um, places where young women um, are not improving as quickly as uh, boys are, even though they're performing at a higher level. We know um, that we want to close the gaps by everybody moving up, not by um, the top group moving down. And then finally, I would say um, we know that there's still significant work to do um, in closing gaps um, with uh, groups of students who qualify for free and reduced price lunch in comparison to those who don't um, for our, our emergent bilingual students um, in comparison with our native English speakers for our students who are identified with special needs. Um, we know that we can't do this work alone, um, which is why I think it is so important to be able to have conversations with groups um, like the League of Women Voters, both in terms of how we support public education, but also in terms of how um, we can help right there within our own communities, um, which is why we need you um, and why we need to be able to work together. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my slides and would love to just um, open it up for a dialogue. Um, you've heard a little bit about uh, what work I'm doing, but would love to just hear any questions you have uh, that I might be able to help out with. Anyone is welcome to put their questions in the chat box, or you may just simply unmute yourself and uh, ask yourself. I have one. Sure. Um, a lot of the programs that you mentioned uh, are outside of the traditional reading, writing, and arithmetic. How do you respond to the contingent of parents and voters that feel that those programs don't belong in public education? Yeah, sure. So thank you. Um, so in addition to what, let me say this first, in addition to what um, I shared with you, we have very deep supports in the traditional reading, math. Um, we have a math accelerator grant that's happening right now. Um, the governor, through some of the funds made available to help address the pandemic, um, has made available a tutoring program for any student in the state of Colorado in math. Um, lots and lots of focus around supports um, in literacy. But if parents are having concerns about um, things like addressing youth mental health, for example, um, what I would share back is really when we're talking about youth mental health, it's for the purpose of being able to engage in school. Um, when we talk with our teachers, we know that what teachers are really looking for is the ability to focus on their classroom on their content and help move students forward. But they can't do that if kids aren't there. Um, and we definitely have seen an increase in absenteeism uh, since the pandemic. Um, and that sense of belonging that kids feel like um, in classrooms is so critical to their ability to be able to focus on learning. Um, and so, you, you know, I don't think we have teachers who are interested in becoming um, counselors per se, or um, social workers per se, we do have those um, in our school, but it really is this focus on how do we create an environment where students feel like they belong, where they feel like um, they can excel and where they really can focus on learning. So um, Evie asks, um, what are you doing to support the task force on accountability to ensure that it has 
uh, the information that it needs to come up with well-rounded recommendations. Um, one of Evie's concerns is um, that most of the members have connections uh, to charter schools, which serve only a small minority of students in the state. Yeah, so thank you. Um, so certainly one of the main areas of work for the Department of Education um, is both uh, supporting through staffing um, and many times leading uh, the different task forces, including the task force on assessments, accountability and accreditation. Um, and we really uh, are trying to stay grounded in that task force on starting with what is a quality school um, what are the kind of experiences that we believe should be included in quality schools? Um, and what are the implications that that has then for how we would measure what quality looks like? Um, I, I know that there have been some uh, questions about the membership. Um, we have sitting school district superintendents um, who are on uh, the accountability task force. Um, they Their voice, I think, is... Um, one of the most knowledgeable voices on the task force in terms of what actually happens in school districts. And I think we're working really hard to make sure that there's opportunity for lots of input from a diversity of perspectives uh, around that. I, I was just with um, the Denver area superintendents group last week, last Friday. Um, Rob Anderson uh, from Boulder Valley um, is on the task force and he raised um, this as well. Um, one of the, his recommendations was making sure that we're having sessions outside of the task force sessions so that people have enough knowledge about what actually is in the accountability system right now. We're talking from a place of uh, knowledge and understanding um, and so that the recommendations really are grounded in what is happening or isn't happening currently. So I have a, a question. One of the things that I do with the league is to follow the legislation mm -hmm. that goes through each session um, and was excited about the increases in funding yeah. um, that happened during the last session. In, in addition to funding, um, are there areas of legislation that you would like to see go through that'll support public education where the league is very much in support of public education. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, um, I am actually really heartened by how much investment there has been in public mm -hmm. ed. Um, we have almost completely bought down the budget stabilization factor. And in fact, many of the legislators I've spoken with um, getting ready to come into the session believe that this year will completely have um, fully funded education. Um, you know, fully funding it really does mean that we're about where we should have been, you know, more than a decade ago. Um, and so, um, that's great to have brought it back up to where we should have been. And you just have to, you know, go to the grocery store or fill up your gas tank to know that everything is more expensive now. And um, it's an area that I think we're gonna need to continue to invest in. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful. We also have a school finance task force that's meeting. Um, they've just had their first session um, to come up with recommendations around the School Finance Act. Um, and I'm hopeful that we'll be able to think about some places where we can um, make deeper investments. If you're asking me where I believe we need to um, really focus on, I would say the group of students that has the largest gap right now statewide is with our students who are learning English um, as their second language for our emergent bilingual students. And it's a growing population outside of metro areas. I think many of our smaller districts are not as well prepared um, as some of the more urban um, centers are. Um, and it's a place where we're seeing in some cases gaps as large as 40, 45 plus points um, mm -hmm. between our students who are learning English um, as a second language and our students who are native English speakers. Um, these are kids who I know are incredibly capable. When we look at the performance of third and fourth graders who actually take the literacy test in Spanish, we're below 20% proficiency. Um, and that's kids who are learning in their native language. So we have, clearly have lots of work that we need to, to do in that space. Um, and I'd be hopeful 
that we might be able to address um, some of those needs, um, particularly because um, as it spreads across the state, um, there's just less capacity uh, across districts. So I see a question in the chat about yep. school um, lunch, breakfast and lunch being made available, which is great. Um, so um, we are continuing to both encourage families to fill out the free and reduced price lunch forms, um, but we're also working to try to come up with some proxies um, that are using census tract data so that we can get a better sense of um, what's happening in districts in the event that we don't get full um, return of uh, those free lunch forms um, because it does have an impact for Title I um, services. And we wanna make sure that we're thinking about how we can get a better assessment of um, the poverty levels um, in different school districts. So that, that definitely is something that's um, gonna be important. Um, we also, just while we're talking about the topic, um, you know, during the pandemic, one of the programs that started was the pandemic EBT cards, where families were actually given a, a, like a debit card that was loaded with $40 per month. Sorry, my lights just went off. $40 per month per child um, for um, as a replacement for summer food programming. Um, and uh, we're in the process right now of looking at how we might be able to, the, the federal government is allowing um, summer EBT cards. Um, and so we're right now looking at what it would take to be able to start uh, doing that potentially as early as this coming summer um, and working with the Department of Human Services um, and the Department of Education to be able to uh, make those funds available to families that qualify. Can you expand on the proxies that you're, hoping to use? Yeah, so um, we also look at census track data. So the census um, collects information um, about income. Um, and so we can look at census track information to see within a school district, for example, um, what are the poverty levels uh, via the census uh, to be able to get a sense of um, what, uh, what we anticipate to be the need um, in, in the event that we don't have all of those free lunch forms filled out. Does the uh, State Department of Education or the accountability have any authority or interest in oversight of district type charter schools or other schools that tend to be popping up that may or may not have, say they have educational sorts of goals, but um, maybe no oversight? Sure. So charter schools um, are public schools, just like district schools, and they are subject to all of the same requirements, both in terms of the assessment program and all uh, of our accountability programs. And so charter schools just received their data in the exact same way that um, a district school would have received that data last week. Um, the only schools that haven't received their accountability results yet, yet are our alternative education campuses. So schools that are um, working um, in an alternative education setting and those ratings, they, they use a different um, accountability system um, that is a little bit more sensitive to over age students um, who are behind in school. And those results will be coming out um, later this month. But charter schools are subject to the exact same requirements, uh, both in terms of testing requirements and um, accountability requirements. So as a follow-up then, the State Department then oversees these things. We do, that, yeah. They provide the oversight. We do, yeah. In the exact same way we do for districts, yes. I, I don't know what you mean by oversight, but you might be asking a question that uh, Commissioner Cordova didn't answer. Um, Oversight, what do you mean by that? Are, are you asking Susan or are you asking me? I'm, I'm asking Susan what yeah. she meant by oversight so that, uh, Susanna, when you answered yeah. the question, you know, like uh, sure. Susan got the answer that she was looking for. <laughs> well, I, I mean with oversight, is there any any um, 
data gathered? Is there any assessment of the data that's gathered? Is there anybody that is responsible for, for this particular kind of oversight? Um, does the oversight include all phases from financial to to hiring to all of those kinds of things? Just exact, that's sure. what I consider oversight as okay. being. That somebody is responsible for those things that happen, not necessarily, i.e. public school in the public schools, but things that the public schools are responsible for that I get concerned that maybe they're not being overseen. Overseen. Right. So let me give a really quick update about how the kind of oversight that you're talking about um, typically happens. And then when the state board would get involved. Um, so uh, an individual charter school would be authorized typically by a school district. Right, right. And the school district would then have the oversight that you are referencing uh, at an accountability level. Charter schools also will have a board of directors um, and the board of directors would oversee the hiring of the principal, the financials, they have that obligation um, at the board of director level, but the school district has to monitor the progress of any individual charter school including achievement outcomes, financial um, viability, enrollment, um, all of those things. We do have an organization in Colorado called the Charter School Institute. Mm -hmm. And so in some cases, charter schools are not authorized by a district, but instead by the Charter School Institute. In fact, they just did a presentation to the Board of Education, the Colorado State Board of Education in August's meeting um, to give uh, an update on the work that they do um, in oversight of charter schools that are authorized through the, uh, the Charter School Institute. This is but, very confusing to somebody who's not that familiar yep. with it. Yeah. Why would someone, why would a parent put a child in a, a charter school if, as you say, they are entirely subject to the same expectations, rules, data about everything they do. I, I must be missing something. Yeah, I, I think that in some cases, parents might be looking for a kind of program that the charter school offers that they feel um, meets their child's needs. Um, in some cases, there are charter schools that emphasize STEM education or classical education or a Montessori education. Um, I think there are a variety of different reasons why families exercise choice, um, both in district schools as well as in charter schools. But to your point, all public schools in Colorado are required to participate in the same data collection, the same assessment program, the same rating system for accountability purposes um, if they're district schools or charter schools. But not the same content in what they teach? All public schools are required to adopt the Colorado standards. Um, and in our state constitution, school districts, um, including charter schools, have local control around the selection of curriculum. But everyone is required to adopt the Colorado standards. So I have then a question about Woodland Park mm -hmm. and the problems they've been having, or the choice, I won't say problems, the choice choices they're making about um, our state standards. And I'm wondering uh, what your thoughts about that are and um, how it's connected in some ways to the school district board, uh, uh, you know, the school board elections that are coming up um, with some candidates that might be challenging what's been happening in public schools, so. Um, so let me let me speak first broadly and then um, try to address the specifics about Woodland Park. Um, so in Colorado, um, by statute every, I believe it's six years, um, we go through a process to revise the standards. Um, in Woodland Park, the question that has come up is around the social study standards that were adopted last year, um, that the standard setting process always includes um, a committee that has educators on it, both teachers um, and 
experts from the department. Um, we go through a process where we look at um, any new research uh, to determine if our standards need to be updated. In the case with social studies, there was legislation that was passed around topics that needed to be included um, in the social studies um, standards. Um, and so that standard setting um, went through and the state board adopted new standards. Um, I believe it was last spring. It was before I, I got here, but I'm pretty, I'm going to probably miss the exact timing, but it was um, in the spring right before I uh, came on. Uh, school districts have until 2024 to adopt, meet or exceed standards um, that align with what the state has adopted. Um, and then we'll be able to select materials and curriculum um, that align to the standards. And the next round of social studies assessments, um, because social studies is one of the grades, one of the content areas that we assess, um, will go into effect in um, spring of 24. And so school districts have from now until 2024 to adopt standards that meet or exceed the Colorado standards in social studies. Well, there's been a lot of uh, press um, about what Woodland Park um, is uh, doing right now um, with the adoption of the American birthright standards. Um, the State Board of Education reviewed the American birthright standards and determined that they did not uh, meet the requirements that we have um, for standards. And so our expectation would be that Woodland Park, just like any other district, um, adopt standards that meet or exceed the Colorado standards um, by um, spring of 24, fall of 24. Can I um, add something here because it's related to what we've been talking with. Um, you can go to our um, Education Task Force website and um, click on the State Board of Education meetings and listen to recordings uh, from past meetings. And I think you'll find them very interesting um, with answering uh, some of your questions as they come up across the year. I think there was a part of the question that maybe got into school board elections also. That was, it was kind of connected to, yeah. you know, as we think about who we're going to be um, electing and we're thinking about the candidates that are, that are um, being presented to us in different districts. Um, I think the voters need to be really aware of, of uh, the candidates' stances on these things. Do you have any any advice for us as voters? Yeah, I mean, I, I think my advice would be like um, in, in any election, I think it's really important uh, for people to make informed choices. You know, we live in a democracy um, and diversity of opinion, I think is a, is a good thing. And, you know, your vote matters. Um, and so trying to become as informed as possible. Um, is going to be really, uh, I think, critical in any school board election. School board elections tend to be sleepy elections, um, and um, the the issues at play in school districts are not sleepy issues. And so, I think like being informed really makes a big difference uh, in terms of what happens. Um, there's a comment in the chat: What happens if Woodland Park still does not meet or exceed state standards by the fall of 24? Um, so our expectation is always that school districts do adopt, um, meet or exceed standards. Um, what can be tricky is Colorado, because it's a local control state, um, can every school district can choose their own materials. Um, and so our enforcement efforts really are around the adoption of the standards and we enforce that through our assessment program typically um, is how we do that. Um, if, you know, any specific, in any specific area, if um, family members or constituents have concerns about um, what's happening with the selection of materials, that's something that should most likely be voiced um, through the process at a school board. Every school board, when they select materials, um, typically has a in-board policy, has some sort of process that's outlined for how public can give input on those things. 
Peggy had a question and I don't want to miss it here. Um, uh, when we were talking about charter schools, uh, she wanted to know if parents still need to get their students to charter schools without bus support. Yeah, again, um, this is largely going to be a more local uh, approach with charter schools in some districts. Um, they may have transportation provided to all schools, including charter schools. Um, in one case, we there's a grant that provides transportation um, to students um, uh, who are attending charter schools. And in some cases, I think charter schools use their own funds or philanthropic funds to provide transportation. Um, typically, when parents are exercising choice, if transportation is not provided, then they need to um, transport their children um, to a school if it's um, a choice school. Um, that frequently is the case. Susan, you're, you're um, muted. No? no there we go. There we go. No. <laughs> Just one more question. I don't want to belabor the, the issue of charter schools, but also the charter schools and other schools then, I assume, have to take the same state tests yes. that public schools do. Yes, they do. And those those results are also public. That They're very, very public. There's actually, um, I'll drop a link um, in the chat. Um, the Colorado Sun, um, has created um, a very nice interactive tool. Um, it's interesting. Um, one of the things that we have to do as a state agency is make sure that all of our websites are accessible and meet all of the requirements for accessibility, which means um, it has to be readable um, for anybody who might have um, a disability in being able to um, see it. Um, and so, so we're not always as nimble, I think, as private organizations can be with some of the data displays, but I'll drop a link in the chat um, with a very nice data display of all school districts in Colorado with um, their assessment results, both achievement results and growth results, um, which is really nice. Let me drop it in the chat here. Let's see. It's an interactive map. And um, on this interactive map, you can actually go to your district. So like if you wanted to look at Larimer County, you could click on Larimer County and you, let me see if I can find Larimer County here. Boulder, open. Um, and you can just click on it and it'll show you um, your elementary and middle school results, your high school results. You can go backward. Um, the most recent year is the year that will show up on the map. Um, and then you can also look um, at proficiency. So that's like how well are kids doing against their grade level expectations? And then growth will show you how quickly are kids growing. So the goal is if you're growing at the 50th percentile, if you think of this as like when you took your kids or your grandkids to the doctor and they say they're at the 60th percentile in height or the 40th percentile in weight. That means if they're at the 60th percentile, they're taller than 60% of the kids. If they're at the 40th percentile, they're at the, you know, they're, they're doing better than 40% of the students. Our goal is always to have um, 50 is the state average. And so if it's a school district or a child that's behind, you want them to be faster than the state average um, to be able to do it. So it's a really nice map. Jen C, do you want to ask your question aloud? That's in the chat. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I'm a little bit sick. So that's why I was uh, typing. Um, but yeah, I know that like, um, so for reference, I am a um, graduate student in um, social work and public health at CSU. So, uh, and my internship right now is with a school-based healthcare center. Um, so I'm really interested in um, kind of some of the mental health initiatives that you had talked about 
uh, in your PowerPoint. And I know that like PSD, we got a, um, there was a grant for bolstering mental health supports. And then there was also a fellowship program that was also initiated in PSD this um, year. So I guess I'm just wondering like what the, um, I guess, long-term, say like the, you know, five-year plan for like mental health initiatives are um, and kind of like on the statewide level um, and like particularly too and like, you know, like the title one schools or rural schools that maybe have less support. Yeah. So I just dropped a link in the chat um, to a conference that we're hosting tomorrow, actually. Um, And this conference tomorrow um, is the um, title, The Landscape of Well-Being and Belonging. Um, And it's in Colorado Springs um, over the next couple of days. And um, it will have support for educators, um, building administrators, school counselors, psychologists, social workers, nurses, health educators, classroom teachers, wellness coordinators, depending on the school or the district, there are lots of different titles of folks who are um, working in this space. Um, And there'll be sessions and breakouts around all of the different topics that you'll see listed um, on that link. Um, We've had long-term initiatives around bullying prevention, for example, or positive behavior interventions and supports, what we call PBIS, so kind of like being good um, sort of programs um, to create uh, an environment of safety and positivity for students, um, dropout prevention breakouts, um, student engagement uh, opportunities, so a whole host of different things. Um, this is an area where we know that um, there's a focus on multiple levels, and so it's like what are the kind of like general things that we want to support all teachers in being able to implement in their class, kind of like um, in the space of creating positive classroom culture and environment. But then as the needs become more intense, thinking about what does it look like for a counselor or a psychologist or a social worker where they're likely working with students who have higher needs um, and need support around more specialized services. Um, so that gives you just kind of a little bit of a picture of um, the kind of work that we're doing there. Um, and you'll see um, some of the different folks who are doing keynotes um, in, in these sessions, so. We've been talking a lot about children, <laughs> but I have a question. Sure. One of the things that you were saying was Uh, We need to focus on recruitment of teachers as well as retention. Um, uh, I'm very interested in recruitment. And uh, if I were were a um, high school senior trying to figure out what I was going to major in, what would you advise me to do if one of my strong considerations is teaching? Yeah, well, hopefully we're talking with you before you're a senior. Um, (laughs) One of the things um, that we've really been working on are um, opportunities for internships and apprenticeships, including in education. Um, And so we've got work that's happening with our educator talent unit. Um, I'm gonna just give you lots of resources here today. Um, Here's the link to our educator talent um, website where the goal is to attract, prepare, support, and retain um, high quality educators for the state. Um, And you'll see right there, we've got um, supports for prospective students um, who might be thinking about going into education. Um, We've got information about how to teach in Colorado, including all of the different pathways into teaching. Um, We've got information about all of the different alternative pathways into becoming a school leader. Um, Because one of the things I think that um, we're losing teachers who don't think that there's a pathway to um, a career um, and and we wanna keep them in education, but help them think about other ways that they might be able to learn and grow um, in their leadership um, within that. Um, So lots of resources on this page. we have a requirement in Colorado. And we uh, one of our task forces is looking at um, stronger connections between what happens in K twelve and what happens after K twelve, mm-hmm. and 
we have a, a program that we call the ICAP, the Individual Career Advising Program, um, Advisement Program. And every student should have an individualized plan that they start working on, hopefully between eighth and ninth grade, that helps them map out like what is it they want to consider um, as a course of studies. Um, it typically starts with an interest inventory so that kids, you know, when I was growing up, I'm, I'm the first one in my family to graduate from college. Like the only jobs I knew about were like the jobs my parents did. My dad worked at a factory. My mom was a school secretary and then teacher, doctor, lawyer, nurse. Like that's all I knew. Um, nobody gave me a career interest survey. Um, and so like, I don't know, maybe I could have been an engineer. I had no idea what an engineer did, right? I, I didn't know any of those things. We're really trying to bring those um, opportunities to kids earlier through an interest survey. Um, and then if students are interested in um, education as a potential career, there are lots of ways that they can get involved in high school as college students um, and then afterward um, to join the uh, teaching profession. And I would also say, even if there are people who um, didn't think that education was for them, but they're now considering it, it's still not too late. But there are so many different alternative pathways into teaching. Um, and we are always, anytime I'm in an Uber, um, I'm always talking with people about, you know, like, what are you interested in doing and how can we get you into education? And that's from things like, have you ever considered being a substitute teacher? Have you ever thought about being a CDL licensed bus driver? Um, because we have so many opportunities in education. And I think sometimes people just don't even realize that the opportunities are there or that they could be eligible for them. In fact, if anybody here is interested in substitute teaching, I'd be more than happy to help you find out how you can give back to a district in your hometown. Anyone else? Thanks, Evie. It's great to see you. Kathy, would you like to wrap it up or shall I? You can go for it. I started. You can, okay. <laughs> you can do the closing. <laughs> but okay, thank great. you so much. <laughs> Yes, I know you all uh, join us in thanking Commissioner Cordova for her time and energy and commitment to our state and our state's children. Thank you. Thank you for being here and for your time. It's great uh, to, to see the... you all. I'm going to drop my great. phone number in the chat great. in case anybody wants to get in touch with me. Um, the best way to reach me is via text. Five, six, three, one. Um, but you're more than welcome to reach out at any time. I actually have one more question. Sure. As a leaguer, and to everybody who else who is on this as a person in the league, what what's one thing we might do to help to help foster public education? Yeah, I I, I would say that you're already doing a lot of the right things, um, which is getting interested, getting informed, and getting engaged. Um, and the other thing that I would say is, you know, like I mentioned, um, school board races in particular really can be pretty sleepy. I just moved here from Texas and um, we saw enormous changes happen mm -hmm. in school board races that really nobody was paying much attention to. And then suddenly everybody's paying attention because of the changes that are so large. Um, and so I would say no matter where you are on the spectrum of what you think should or shouldn't be happening, the most important thing we can do is pay attention. Um, and so, you know, um, you obviously are because you're here, um, but I would say like, um, make sure you're bringing people along with you, um, particularly in your local school board races. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, well, that really message should go to our voter services yeah. focus. Yes. I agree. Yes. Well, it's nice to see you all. Thank you for the invitation. Have a wonderful Thank you again time. for being with us. Yes. Bye -bye. Thank you for serving the state in, in such an important capacity. Thank you.
Bye-bye. 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 Kathy. Yes. Is there anything else? You wanted to talk about the web page for a minute, didn't you? I did at or the did beginning. did you already do that? Great. Yeah, I did that at the beginning, so I think we're fine. Okay, great. Um, well, we are looking at meeting in four weeks' time again. Uh, are there any topics anyone here um, would like to you know, have some focus. Okay, if you think of anything, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'll put I my... Hmm? I wonder if there's something, because that's that's elections, right? Um, and people will be voting at that point. I don't know if there's something special that we, that we can do um, uh, around school board elections, because that's, that's, you know, will be one of the areas of concern, I think, um, mm -hmm. for, many, for many places. So, not... uh, well, uh, keep an eye on uh, the Colorado League's calendar as uh, candidate forums start to pop up around the state. Uh, I know that uh, the Gunnison Watershed School District right. has an important uh, school board election, the first in 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, suddenly there are two slates running. So uh, we know they're not the only, um, but uh, keep an eye on our calendar for uh, candidate forums. Another, another idea that just popped into my mind is is a training that might be specific for people who want to observe school board meetings. Great. How, what they should do and how they should go about it. Um, you know, what's, what's, a, what's a fruitful, productive way of doing that. So it sounds Great. like some of this should be communicated both to the voter services and to the observer core. Exactly. Um, the state league is encouraging um, all Colorado leagues to consider uh, observer cores for school boards if they don't already have them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we're happy to provide uh, resources and support. All right. Well, <laughs> have a good evening. Everybody. Yes, have a good evening. Thank you for being here. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.